Hello everyone, welcome back to the show. You're listening to the Fantasy Football Uptick. I'm Jeremiah Blue and today we're going to be finishing up our running back discussion. Remember, if you like what you hear, please hit subscribe. It costs you nothing and it helps us out a lot. With that, let's jump right into the discussion. The first guy I'd like to talk about is Nick Chubb. Honestly, Nick Chubb was supposed to be in my tier 3 when Duke Johnson was still going to be a factor, but now that Duke Johnson has been traded to the Texans, he's no longer a factor when it comes to Nick Chubb as far as taking anything away from him in the pass game. The big thing to know about Nick Chubb is that the number two back there is going to be Kareem Hunt. But Kareem Hunt's going to be suspended for the first eight games of the season. So really he won't be there until the ninth game for the Browns. There's typically only 13 weeks in a fantasy football regular season. And the number one goal, your very first goal in fantasy should be make the playoffs. You make the playoffs and you got a chance to win in fantasy football. You don't have to have the best team to win a championship, but you have to have a good team to make the playoffs in fantasy football most of the time. So with that being said, eight of those 13 games, Nick Chubb is going to be a workhorse. I can see him getting upwards of 20 to 25 carries per game with Duke Johnson gone. I was originally expecting Duke Johnson to be on the field about 30% of the snaps. That's no longer going to be the case, which means Nick Chubb will thus move up a little bit. I can't imagine him being on the field less than 80% of the snaps on the standard basis. Now, there will be somebody else who comes in to change him out there in, in Cleveland, but without Duke Johnson with being there, it's going to be a lot of Nick Chubb, and he's going to get all that workload. We're expecting him to get a lot of touchdowns. That's going to be a very high-powered offense. And, like I said, he does have hands, so he can catch out of the backfield. He showed us that last year in a couple of plays when he was given the opportunity to catch that he can actually catch. So what he does is he moves up into that tier two for me. I'm still very high on Dalvin Cook, so he's gonna he still falls behind Dalvin Cook for me in my rankings, but he's above Mixon. So I've got the first four, which we've already talked about as my tier one. It's basically everybody's tier one. It's gonna be Elliot, Barkley, Christian McCaffrey, and Kamara. Elliot's starting to drop down my list now that he's been holding out, and I've been doing a little bit more research, just kind of like constantly getting as much information on these guys as I can. I'm moving Elliott down to number two, and I might even move him down to number three. And we're just talking about standard. In PPR or half-point PPR, I've already got McCaffrey over Elliott because I know McCaffrey's going to be involved in the passing game. I know Barkley's going to be involved in the passing game. I think Elliott will be involved, but with Pollard there, now he's still going to be active because he's going to be on the field a lot, assuming he shows up for week one and beyond, and they can work out a contract situation with him. I was noticing that Elliott, at the end of the year, Week 14, which for me, it's so step one is make the playoffs. You've got to make the playoffs, which is why I love Chubb so much because eight games is going to be the workhorse. There's only at least five games. So where he's working in Kareem Hunt into that offense and Kareem Hunt's not going to come in and right away just take a heavy workload. He's going to be working in very slowly because he's going to have missed eight games. So he's going to miss eight weeks worth of practice at a minimum. So once he comes in, it's not just gonna be a right away, they're gonna hand him half the workload, right? But even if they did, I still think Chubb is a tier three. So assuming Hunt was not suspended, I would still call Chubb a tier three running back based off of his talent alone and the offense that he's in and how they're trying to operate within that offense. Like last year, they were trying to run the football. That is what they wanted to do. I don't see that changing this year, even though they've added a bunch of weapons. All that does is going to open up more space to run the football. The next guy on this list for me is Leonard Fournette. Now, Leonard Fournette has a pedigree of being a really good back all the way from high school to college, and it just never seemed to work out for him in the NFL. At least that's what people think, because if you look at the stats, his yards per carry is so low, it's under four, which is really bad for, especially when you got two years worth of data on a, on a player. That being said, the first year he only played 13 games and then last year he played eight games. But if you look at what he did in 2017 as opposed to what he did in 2018, because in 2018 he came into the he came into the offseason injured. So he was he was never able to get in shape because it was a hamstring injury. And you I mean obviously you can work out but there's only so much you can do. You can do a lot of cardio. So he wasn't able to drop that weight. He went into it heavy. He was, And then he got hurt. He was hurt throughout the year. He never really got into great shape. And he said that at one point towards the end of the year, around December time frame, that he's not in as good a shape as he should be at this point in the year. So I want to take that and kind of throw that season out. I know that you don't ever really want to do that, but... They had injuries across the offensive line. Blake Bortles was terrible. And he faced eight-man boxes 35.34% of the time. So over 35% of the snaps, he faced an eight-man box. So you're like, okay, is that a lot? Is that a little? Well, I'll say that with Gurley, he only faced an eight-man box 8.2% of the time. 
and Elliott was only able to only had to face an eight-man box 24% of the time. So he faced an eight-man box more than those guys with not as good an offensive line and not as good a quarterback. So this year, you add the factor of Nick Foles, you add a healthy offensive line, you add that he's in better shape, and I know that that's always the saying, hey, best shape of my life. But with him, I actually do believe that he's at least in better shape than he was last year based on the fact that he's coming into this training camp healthy. Again, if you look back in 2017, he was able to average per game 103.2 yards. In the 13 games he played, he scored 10 touchdowns. They were the most running back centric offense in the NFL. They didn't run the most, but there was also the teams that ran more than them had running quarterbacks that equated into that. But as far as running back centric, the Jaguars in 2017 were the most running back centric offense, and I think they're going to kind of get back to that. They got a new offense coordinator, and he's going to he's going to spread it out a little bit. I know there's going to be a lot more shotgun, which we haven't seen Leonard Fournette run a lot of shotgun before, but I do think he, he's got the ability to. I mean, this is a guy that he looks big, and that's kind of what they play him as. Like he's a power back, so he's more of an up the middle power run scheme kind of guy, and that's what he's been his whole career. That being said, he does have the speed to bounce it to the outside, and hopefully, again, we're going to have to figure out whether he has the vision or not. I'm banking on him having the vision, and there's just nobody here. When it comes to this tier and below, this is the one true workhorse running back left on the list. All the other workhorses are on the top of the list. That's why we moved Chubb up to Tier 2 is because he's got the talent, he's got the roster. This is the guy who can make that leap as well because Leonard Fournette's going to get the ball 20-plus times a game as long as he stays healthy, he's going to get over. I mean, he, he's involved in the pass game. He's involved in the run game. So, like I said, in 2017, he averaged more than 100 yards per game. He could do the same thing. This is a better offense than he had in 2017. He's in a better situation, and he's approaching. He's not at the contract year yet, but they could cut him next year if he if he has another bad year. Where is if he has a good year, he's going to be in line for payday. So he's probably approaching this like it's a contract season. For him, so I expect good things from Fournette this year. Right below that, I have Carryon Johnson. If this was PPR, I might move Carryon Johnson over Fournette because I can, with Theoretic gone, I could totally see Carryon getting roughly 60, 60 receptions. He's going to be the third down back now. They do have C.J. Anderson there. The only thing I'm really worried about there with C.J. Anderson is that C.J. Anderson becomes the goal line back, and the Detroit Lions have had a tendency to kind of swap out their backs quite a bit, augmenting them. That's the dreaded running back by committee, but this is the most talented guy on that team. I do think that the Lions are underrated. Stafford, he had played all year with a broken back, or at some point during the year he had broke his back, so there was a lot of games there that he was kind of banged up, and the offense never really got going. Uh, the offensive line struggled health last year in, in Detroit, so I think that that offense is going to be much improved, and I think it's, it's a very underrated offense because Matthew Stafford is a legitimate quarterback. They do have decent receivers there. They have a good offensive line, and I think Carryon Johnson is one of the more talented running backs in the NFL. He actually reminds me a lot of Alvin Kamara. Obviously, he's not on the Saints, but he has a lot of the same tendencies as far as the way he plays running back. The next guy on my list is Derrick Henry, and I am higher than most people on Derrick Henry from the simple fact that from week 14 to week 17, he was an absolute monster. I actually thought he was going to be a monster before then, but Coach LaFleur never actually was able to just get him the rock. I, and I don't understand how that happened because if I'm LaFleur and I walk into a running back room and there's Derrick Henry and Deion Lewis standing there, like my first instinct is like give it to the giant man over there because he's going to be able to run people over. He's fast enough when he gets to the edge. He can outrun people. I watched a lot of tape on Derrick Henry trying to figure out why they weren't using him and if there's any holes in his game. Now, he's not as shifty as other backs. And actually, believe it or not, him going up the middle seemed to be where he had the most problems because he can't actually move left or right. He's not quick enough to do any real jump cuts. But when he gets to the edge, a full head of steam, and that stiff arm, that stiff arm is a cheat code, like a real-life Madden cheat code every single time he seemed to throw that stiff arm he would break a tackle watch that jaguars run he, he throws like three stiff arms knocks like three people off of him takes it all the way down for a 99 yard run i'm just saying derrick henry's a monster and if they're watching the same tape i'm watching they cannot eliminate him from the running game the way they did in 2018 he will be a workhorse this year i have a very strong feeling about this so standard ranking I have Derrick Henry as my next running back on this list. You obviously have to take into account the risk involved and the history with these guys, like Derrick Henry and Deion Lewis. Last year, they split a lot. 
I mean, there was games when Deion Lewis actually had more play as far as like snaps per game, which that's usually what I look at rather than carries. I look at the snaps. How, how much are you in the game? How many opportunities are you getting to be on the field? And last year, they split a lot with Deion Lewis, but towards the end of the year, from week 14 to week 17, Derrick Henry was an absolute workhorse. That was when they were the most successful. That's when they were really hitting their stride. I think they go back to that this year. I know he's banged up right now, but typically running backs kind of stay off the field a lot during the preseason. So I kind of, I don't, I'm not too concerned with the Derrick Henry injury. I think I would feel safe drafting the standard league in a PPR league. I would be a little bit more concerned because he's like literally not involved at all in the passing game. But I feel like that's going to change because he's going to be on the field a lot because you're going to want to feed that guy after seeing what they saw last year. After they go back and reevaluate the mistakes they made last year, their biggest mistake was not getting Derrick Henry more involved. That being said, that brings me right to the next guy, which is Aaron Jones, who is the best running back in Green Bay. So you would think that now they finally got a new coach. Mike McCarthy was really kind of holding uh, Aaron Jones back, really trying to make Jamal Williams a thing, but he just wasn't as good. Now, what they say is he's a better pass blocker, which makes sense. You got Aaron Rodgers and you want that guy in there for pass protection purposes. But after you watch what happened last year, how can you not use Aaron Jones more exclusively? That being said, we're going back to Matt LaFleur, which Matt LaFleur made the mistake of not putting Derrick Henry in there. So he scares me. Aaron Jones scares me because of the coach there and how he likes to run that two running back offense as much as possible, even to the point where you, you had to know that Derrick Henry was the best player on the field and you're still running that two running back offense. So in that, in that aspect, it does scare me just a little bit. Um, and then you got Marlon Mack. Now, Frank Reach has a history of running a two running back set. In fact, we can go back to 2014, which I did a lot of research because I really love the Colts this year. I love their offensive line. I love their quarterback. I love the fact that they play in the AFC. And I just love their mentality. They want to run the football. And when they did run the football last year, Marlon Mack had monster games. Now, going back and looking at these, uh, these stats, since 2014, Brandon Oliver was under Frank Reach. He, 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 he was the lead back. So these are the lead backs on a Frank Reach run offense. 160 carries in 2014 for Brandon Oliver. 2015, it was 184 for Melvin Gordon. 2016 was 155 for Ryan Matthews. 2017 was 173 for LeGarrette Blunt, And the 2018 was 195 for Marlon Mack. Now, glass is half full that I take out of that that uh, basically information that I just gave you is the most of those, the most carries in that scenario was 2018 Marlon Mack, 195. And he was injured for a lot of last year. So clearly they realize he's the best back. I know Hines was on for a lot of third down stuff. They've already said they want to get Marlon Mack more involved in the passing game because he is easily the best running back on this team. I think the reason Hines was playing a lot of that third down stuff last year is because Marlon Mack was so banged up last year and they were trying to kind of take some of that stress off of him. That being said, there's a history here, a history of backs never getting to 200 carries. So I, I do get a little scared with Marlon Mack. As much as I like what he could do if he got closer to 300 carries, I think he could be a top five running back. And that's not because I like Marlon Mack as a talent. I mean, he's fine. But I'm banking on the Colts being one of the top five offensive lines and Andrew Luck being one of the top three or four quarterbacks in the league. This is going to be an outstanding offense. This is a Chiefs offense, essentially. They're that kind of talented. Assuming they give Marlon Mack that kind of run, he's going to be an absolute monster in this, in this offense. The last guy on my list is going to be Devontae Freeman. And I actually like Devontae Freeman. I love what the Falcons have done offensively. They went into the draft, and I was thinking they for sure are going to go defense, defense, defense. And what do they do? They draft an offensive lineman. They continue to make their offense better the year before that. They, draft, they drafted Calvin Ridley. They have elite receivers. They have, a, they have an elite quarterback. They have an elite offensive line. And I think Devontae Freeman is by far the best running back on the roster now that Tevin Coleman's out of there. So this could be in a very efficient offense, similar to that of like the Saints. And I, while I don't see a scenario similar like Kamara, I do not see a scenario where either one of them are like really dominating the touches on their own football team, but they're going to get enough touches. They're still going to be the lead back. And if their offenses are as efficient as I think they are, they can they can get a lot of touchdowns and be efficient with each touch they get. And that's what I see with Devontae Freeman. He's only here because of all these guys, he's the one that I don't 
think could end up getting close to that 250 to 300 carries uh, in a year, even if he stayed healthy for 16 games, just based off of the way that the Falcons have used their running backs in the past. That's it for today's show. Later on this week, I'm going to be doing a mock draft where I'm going to be talking about different draft strategies and how I go about drafting and why I go about drafting that way. During that uh, show, I will also be talking about different players that maybe we haven't got to talk to about yet, like some of the rookie running backs, some of the some of the receivers and quarterbacks and tight ends and where I value those as far as positional scarcity goes. If you have any questions, post them in the comments section and I'll be happy to record, uh, respond to all of them. Be sure to like and subscribe to our videos. As I said earlier, that would help us a lot. It doesn't cost you anything. I will be posting new content weekly. Till next time, see ya!